Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at the full careers of bands and artists known for only one song. And I gotta be honest, I feel like this series has gotten bogged down a bit in the 80s and the 90s. The music video era is very kind of the show, but I want to branch out a bit. So instead, let's go back, way back to the 60s. In fact, today we're doing maybe the 60s song ever written. Eastern world, it is exploding. This dude with the frog voice and the page boy haircut is Barry McGuire. The year was 1965, and a white dude playing an acoustic guitar was not nearly as much of a tired cliché, partly because there was a good chance they'd actually sing about something that matters, as is the case here. Protest music was really starting to gain ground, and this was one of the first to hit it big on the pop charts. And this wasn't one of those happy hippie anthems either. I mean, you can see it right in the title. Yeah, none of that give peace a chance, all you need is love crap. No, the message is very clear. The world is going to explode and we're all going to fucking die. I'm telling you, man, it's all gonna be okay. Shut up! We're doomed! Of course, to understand the sentiment, you really needed to be there. I think of all the hate there is in red China. Take a look around to Selma, Alabama. This song is very, very of its time and littered with enough specific references to major world events to make a good solid verse of We Didn't Start the Fire. I mean, check out all his concerns. Human rights abuse in communist China. War in the Middle East. Racial tension and violence in America. In other words, it has zero relevance to the modern day. But, as a snapshot of the world in 1965, you could hardly hope for a more effective song. I mean, you can look at the Beatles or the Stones, but if you really want a song from that year that really mapped out the direction of pop music, I'd listen to this. But that future would be one without Barry McGuire. McGuire largely dropped off the map, even as the 60s seemed to inch ever closer to the day of destruction. Why did such a thing happen? Did he die? I mean, it was the 60s. Ooh, maybe he meant eve of self-destruction. This whole crazy world is just too frustrating that you as you probably know, the early 60s folk scene was one of the most fertile and significant times in music, the soundtrack to an era of increased social consciousness and widespread change. Well, Barry McGuire was a key member and a lead vocalist in one of the biggest, most successful folk bands of the day, a superstar act in the folk scene, the new Christy Minstrels. Christy Minstrels were, um, they were not the hippest act of the time. They were, uh, pretty, uh, non-threatening. Okay, have you ever seen A Mighty Wind, the Christopher Guest mockumentary? Okay, you know the smiley smile, squeaky clean group that all the other folkies hate? That's supposed to be the new Christy Minstrels. I don't think the Minstrels were in a cult that worshipped colors, but yeah, that's supposed to be them. And now there ain't nobody in the whole wide world gonna tell me how to spend my time. You know, I'm just okay, that's Barry. And even with Barry up front singing with his rougher voice, they're, they're still... The Christies are dorks. You can see why Barry eventually wanted out. Like, eventually it was 1964, Beatlemania is storming the country, folk singers are trying to be more relevant to current issues. Uh, even Peter, Paul, and Mary were singing a lot of political music in between the, you know, the Puff and Magic Dragon there. Meanwhile, this is what Barry was being forced to sing. Chim chimney, chim chimney, chim chim cherry, a chimney sweet lucky as lucky can be. Yes, that is in fact a cover of Chim Chim Cherry from Disney's Mary Poppins. I couldn't even make that up. So yeah, for Barry it was either quit the band or spend the rest of the 60s singing Old MacDonald. He quit right at the band's commercial peak and spent some time being a broke loser. That is, until legendary producer Lou Adler scooped him up and put some music in front of him and let him put out an album. This song is something special. It has an awful lot of important things to say about how we grown up surrounding the world. It was recorded okay, I don't know if you know this, but the 60s were really intense and a lot of shit happened. Barry Maguire and Eve of Destruction. Eve of Destruction is, I think, the first big pop hit protest song. 
something that would get a lot more popular as the decade went on. There were protest songs before this too, obviously, most notably from Bob Dylan, but they were not hits. Bob Dylan didn't have his first hit until that year, Like a Rolling Stone. It went to number two. Eva Destruction went to number one. And you tell me over and over and over again, my friend. That seems really unfair, doesn't it? Because Eva Destruction is a complete and total Dylan rip. Raspy voice, harmonica and all. Dylan might as well have sued if there weren't also a billion other Dylan wannabes he had to worry about. And uh, for many people who grew up after the Boomer era, I can see why they might not like this song. I mean, the Baby Boomers certainly love crowing about how much better their music was, so to a lot of people my age, Vietnam War era music just turns their stomach. You will remain in here for eternity listening to whiny protest songs from the 60s. Oh, I hate the government more than you and me. The government stole my goldfish and unplugged my TV. <laughs> I mean, personally, I really like this song, even though the individual details have nothing to do with me or my life. You may leave here for four days in space, but when you return, it's the same old place. Like I said, there are a lot of 60s specific references in it to Jim Crow, the space race, to the draft. They're old enough to kill, but not for voting. A few years after this, the government passed the 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age to 18. I like to think it was entirely because of this song. So see how much better you have it now, 18 year olds? You can vote now. Not that any of you do. Oh, and you can't buy beer anymore either. Thumbs up! If the button is pushed, there's no running away. There'll be no one to save with the world in a grave. For the record, there was a pretty big backlash against this song. Legendary protest singer Phil Ox hated it. And I get why. Cause it's a bit adolescent, naive. I mean, we all go through that phase, right? Where we've just discovered that the world isn't perfect, so we decide the world must be 100% shit and quit telling me to smile, Mom. Everything sucks. The, the songwriter was 19 when he wrote it, and you can tell. And even the Jordan River has bodies but you. Even the Jordan River! Violence in the Middle East! The cradle of civilization! Perish the thought! And despite the song's apocalyptic bent, if you don't know, humanity did in fact survive the 60s. If you're more optimistic, you can listen to a response song some guys wrote, Dawn of Correction. Over and over again, you keep saying it's the end. But I say you're wrong, we're just on the dawn of correction. And it argued that, you know, things are actually getting better and no one's actually crazy enough to start a nuclear war and seriously quit whining. And also there's some stuff in there about how we need to gear up and fight the commies. But ignoring that, I think both sides of this argument had a point. Things did get better and things also got a lot uglier. As a song though, Donna Correction blows. Because it's a response record. And all response records kind of blow. But also it's because Eva Destruction's anger is honest and real. Don't, don't tell him to stop whining. Blood so mad, feels like coagulating. Sorry if he's harshing your buzz, man. But sometimes he just needs someone to look at all the shit going on and yell, fuck this, fuck everything. Oh, crazy world is just too frustrating, man, yeah. And boy, oh boy, you know, I can't pretend that this doesn't all hit really close to home, even though the details are off. And marches alone can't bring integration when you I mean, Yes, segregation is over and the Jordan water war isn't happening anymore, but I mean, the Middle East still sucks. Racism is still ugly. People are still blowing up. Superman kills people now. Well, that was a fun movie to watch while I was writing this episode. Yeah, that felt really appropriate, not gonna lie. No, the song is just a genuine cry of rage. And as the song goes on, the verses get longer and longer, like McGuire is just spontaneously thinking of more things to add on to the rage list. You can bury your dead, but don't leave a trace. Hate your next door neighbor, but don't forget to say grace and tell Even Destruction is righteously pissed off. And pop music just needs more apocalypse songs. We're on the eve of destruction. Eve of destruction. We were on the eve of destruction. Specifically the destruction of Barry McGuire's career.
And now, his follow-up single, California Dreamin'. All the leaves are brown, leaves are brown. Okay, you can tell this was not his follow-up single. This is the Mamas and the Papas. He was real tight with them, for the record. They, they even name-checked him in a song once. And they were gonna let him release California Dreamin' as his next single. But at the last minute, they changed their minds and recorded themselves. Which was probably for the best. So instead of recording one of the greatest pop songs of all time, he released this. Here is Barry Maguire, so let's bring mine. This is his follow-up, Child of Our Times, written by the same guy who wrote Eve of Destruction. That's the grassroots playing backup for him, but uh, not the actual grassroots. The grassroots when you become a real band that got famous for a couple years yet. I don't, I don't know why I'm bothering. Most of you are kids, you don't even know who the grassroots were to begin with. Anyway, let's check out the song. Each moment you're alive, you're that much closer to death. Oh god, this is gonna be even wankstier than the last one, isn't it? Ah, child of our times, child of our times, product of our society. In your burning, turning mind, you are your own worst enemy. This, uh... This is not really doing it for me. I mean, it's, it's a lot less specific than Eva Destruction was, and it's not as catchy, and... I don't wave banners, you don't believe parasites. Instead of being angry, he's, he's lecturing you about how the world is rough and you'll have to defeat your own prejudices, and... Uh, I don't know, if the narrator were addressing it to himself instead of me, this would go down a whole lot better, because... There, there's a level of hippie preachiness that I am willing to tolerate, and this is well past that. Now forever gone is your serenity. For the fleeing fawn, there's no sacred tree. They'll try to make... What the hell did that mean? They'll thank you in the end after they've seen the light. In this live version especially, this, uh, very did not sound great. I mean, granted, you were allowed to sound like that back in the 60s. Just like how in the 90s, everyone sang like this for some reason. I don't know, maybe there just wasn't a market for a guy like McGuire. He didn't write any of his own songs, at least not during this phase of his career. He had before, but not here. I, I looked through his other singles, there's like a lot of Dylan covers in there. I mean, yes, lots of pop acts covered Dylan, but Barry McGuire was already kind of a rip-off Dylan. He was kind of not real enough for the folkies and not pop enough to go mainstream. And if you're gonna be a studio creation, <laughs> let's face it, he wasn't exactly Davy Jones. He kind of looks like a blonde Pete Rose. Only the orphan child will sound the cries of a mistake that could never be rectified. I'm Pete, man. Far out. Oh, quite a bit. Uh, he had a bunch of other songs he released, not a whole lot that I was impressed with, but he also did some acting. Here he is in The President's Analyst. He plays a stoned-out hippie who sings folk songs. It is, granted, not the most challenging role that anyone has ever taken. He also spent a year on Broadway performing in Hair, which is an excellent place to be if you're pretending to be a hippie. Give me a chest with hair. Thick, beautiful hair. So yeah, he did movies, he did Broadway, but mostly he did drugs. A lot of drugs. Yeah, it turns out my eve of self-destruction crack was pretty accurate. To give you a gauge on how far he fell in just a couple years, here's where he was by 1971. <laughs> Werewolves on Wheels, starring Steve Oliver and Severn Darden. This is Werewolves on Wheels. It is about a biker gang who gets cursed and turned into werewolves. I've seen it, and unfortunately it is not as good as I made it sound. So yeah, he really hit bottom, and he looked like he was going to be yet another casualty of the 60s. Until... Yes, he found Jesus. He was a Jesus hippie, a neglected subset of hippies. And he reinvented himself as a Christian musician, and that's what he's been doing for the last 40 years. And you know, I've already told you about my complete and utter disgust for Christian rock, but apparently in the early 70s it was, it was still like real music with like real messages and stuff. Apparently the idea that Christian music should be bland garbage didn't catch on until the end of the decade. I mean, I listened to some of his 70s stuff, I mean, it's still pretty legit. He has an album called Cosmic Cowboy, 
which is very, very strange, and you can listen to it on Spotify, and I'm not sure he'd actually quit drugs like he said at that point. He also has an album called Narnia, which I could not find, but which I have to listen to eventually. He still records today. Christian music, mostly for the kiddies, it seems. He also recorded a new version of Eve of Destruction in 2012. Uh, this one is less about war, has more of an environmental angle. Tell me. Okay, um, when you're singing a song about, you know, the imminent extinction of humanity, I'm, I'm not sure the kids' bop treatment really works for it. Oh, he's fine. Tell me over and over and over again. Yeah, his other songs, yeah, you can skip them. He had written a bunch of songs before he got big, he, he released a whole solo album. I'm not sure why he didn't write his own singles afterwards. The fact that he was broke before he got picked up for a solo career might have had something to do with it. In any case, maybe you could say he deserved better if he, you know, was more, you know, real, more authentic, but in my opinion, his other singles he can do without him. He found his niche outside the mainstream, and if you like Jesus music, by all means, listen to his 70s stuff, and, and if you like his newer kids boppy stuff, uh, well, you probably already listened to it. Oh, and Eva's Destruction holds up. So, if you want a song that implies you should start hoarding canned goods and live in your basement, that's the one I'd go with. Peace.